Hi listeners, I'm Izzy, my pronouns are they and them. Welcome to the Critical Conversations for Social Work podcast. This is Joella. Before we start, we'd like to acknowledge the country that we're recording this episode on today and pay our respects to the Turrbal and Yagara peoples and their elders, past, present and emerging by committing to always remembering that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Welcome back to another episode of Critical Conversations for Social Work. My name is Aaron, a social work student at QUT. My pronouns are he and him. Uh, before diving further, I would like to acknowledge the Indigenous and Torres Strait Island people as the First Nations people in Australia and recognize my privilege to live, study and play on this land. Today, we're having two guests. Both of them are extremely knowledgeable and revered in the area of social studies. They're also the writers of the book, The Rutledge Handbook uh, for Critical Pedagogy, Social Work, and they have worked together for several programs. Now, let's welcome Christy Molly and Philip Applett. How are you going today? Good, good. Oh, Thank you, Aaron. Good. Hi. Good to hear. Now, can you, can you introduce yourself a little bit and maybe also talked about your pedagogy that you are using in your workplace? Okay, well, look, I'll start because Christine asked me to, and uh, <laughs> my name's Philip, of course, and uh, I come from a blue-collar working-class background where uh, I was first in the family to attend a university, so I had no real background on higher education. I went through the state school system. I was lucky, fortunate enough to enter university when it was free, and I must say it really broadened my horizons. I ended up in the social sciences. And so I'm currently a sociologist, and I teach into many programs, including uh, social work. And my base discipline, sociology, I guess, has always raised questions about the nature of society. Uh, it's opportunities and inequalities, and education is part of that. So uh, I've learned from that that education is always something social. It's not just my education. It's not just an individual undertaking. And even when it is, when we're thinking about our own learning, we do that in a social context, always and everywhere in a social context. And that context is really important, or I've learned that over the years. And as for the particular pedagogy that I try to embrace and adopt, I guess the best term would be critical pedagogy or democratic pedagogy. And I'm not unique or alone in this. I didn't invent it. I'm situated in a particular Western educational tradition, going back to at least Plato and the ancient Greeks through people like Rousseau and John Dewey and Paolo Freire in just the last generation, Henry Giraud, people like that today. And look, I'm sure there are parallels in other cultural traditions. I, I'm just simply being honest and saying this is where I started, that that's where I was located and where my reflections began. And critical pedagogy for me, and I think Christine will have a, a different take on this, her own take, is Look, it's an approach that conceives of education not as something neutral that can't be reduced to a set of methods or techniques for transplanting knowledge, you know, in, from one person's head into another, but rather education is always driven by values or an ethos and to recognise that education is political in, in the broader sense, that is, it it's embedded in, it, it reflects and is implicated in the power relations of the society we live in. So if the power relations are very asymmetric, very unequal and authoritarian, then that will be reflected 
in the education system and and in the approaches that are adopted by teachers. So education, pedagogy can either reproduce these power relations or it can bring them into question and perhaps offer the prospect for change. That's the hopeful uh, bit. Mm. So, yeah, we don't start with methods or technologies, but with questions about what is the education for? Who does it serve? I think we've stopped asking those in Australia, those, and certainly in current education policy. We, we assume that we already know the answer and we don't have to raise it. It's for the labour market or it's for jobs. And I'm not saying those things are, are unimportant, but I just think there's so much more to education than that. For the ancient Athenians uh, and for many, many critical educators today, it was far more than that. It meant... Um, asking after what does it mean to lead a worthy life? What does it mean to lead a worthy life? What, what sort of society do we want to live in? What sort of society do we live in? And what's the difference between those, what we want and, and what we are currently situated in? And what sort of education would befit both what we live in and what we would like to see? You know, if you want to live in a dictatorship, then really all you need to learn from your education is how to obey, how to be disciplined and discipline others. But if you want to live, say, in a democracy, you need to be equipped with the capacity to question, to be a critical citizen for an imperfect democracy or the democracy to come, because I don't think we live in a fully democratic society, not at all. So for me, education is always about questioning the things that matter about the world, about society, about ourselves, and inviting others to participate in that questioning, to encourage them to do that across our differing standpoints in the hope that, you know, we might reach a new understanding that does a better job than we've done so far in terms of relating to each other and the planet. So it's different from training. I think education is much more than training. Training is a small part of education, know-how to do a particular task. But training is not by any means necessarily the most important or the central part of education. Education is far more significant than that and far wider reaching. And I'll stop there for the moment. I'm sorry, I've gone <laughs> rather long. Yeah. No, that's all right. I think there's a lot of very valuable information there. I'll maybe unpack a little bit maybe later, but can we have yeah, Christine maybe introduce herself for now? Aaron, can you just remind me what the question was again, please? Just share about who you are and what you do and also the pedagogy you are using in your workplace. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I'm Christine Morley and I'm Professor of Social Work at QUT and the Discipline Lead of Social Work and, and Human Services. And I've been in that role for about five and a half years now. And um, I guess similar to Philip, I am from a working class background. I'm also the first in my family to go to university. So that was my experience. I never imagined that I would be a person who went to university or that I would like it, frankly. And so I, in terms of my my journey as a, as a social work student, I suppose I was um, exposed to sociology and exposed to critical thinking and critical discourses, particularly around medicalisation and mental health. And I had a, a really strong passion about that at the time. And so I was kind of reading everything that I could from a critical perspective in the anti-psychiatry movement and, and things like that. And then I ended up doing a placement in sexual assault where a huge amount of women that I was working with, largely women, um, had been, you know, part of the mental health system or received a mental health diagnosis. And often their experiences of trauma and violence had been minimised in that construction of their uh, experience. And, you know, from there I became very interested in, in working in, in sexual assault. And then I, I did my PhD on the legal system in relation to sexual assault. And so part of, part of the work in, in sexual assault involved educating communities and educating populations so uh, when I went into education as a practitioner I had I'd been a practitioner that had worked in 
you know, feminist organisations, organisations with mandates for social change, organisations with a strong analysis of the political and personal. And then so critical practice was a very kind of natural way for me to be and, and doing that educative work, you know, going into an academic role felt like a natural extension of that, perhaps a capacity to have greater impact by shaping the kinds of practitioners that go into university. I, I think social work education really does make a difference about whether graduates become critical practitioners who are capable of activism and capable of responding to the kinds of complex social problems that our world is going to face into the future, or whether they become foot soldiers for neoliberal agendas. And so I think as a, an early educator, I was using what I thought was critical social work principles to inform my pedagogy. And so it made sense to me to engage in consciousness raising and to decenter myself as an educator and to, you know, develop a, a community of learners and to lead people towards broad change in social movements and, and to have that explicitly critical analysis. And then I began to do a bit more reading about that and became aware of uh, critical pedagogy, which was a movement out of education as I understood it. I mean, it's in a lot of disciplines, but I was particularly interested in the work of Henry Giraud and still remain really interested. Um, he's been one of the most inspiring, I, I think, scholars for me in terms of really, I think, capturing the values about what critical social work is about, but how do we bring those to education and how do we make a difference in the way that we do that. So Henry Giraud's work is about, you know, he talks about critical pedagogy. He might have even been the person to first coin that term. But other people can also talk about activist pedagogy, revolutionary pedagogy. I mean, I think all of those things are um, important democratic pedagogy, as Philip mentioned. But they all offer a rich and political, philosophical approach to education, not just as learning about skills and competencies, but as learning about citizens to be able to contribute to a radically just and democratic world. Mm. That's interesting. I think one thing you, you both mentioned is around education. And uh, I think in critical pedagogy, there is an idea about uh, education being a dialogical process instead of a banking mode, like uh, Philip just described. It's not like producing a a resource from like a factory or, or things like that. So Philip, would, would you mind just maybe expand a little bit more on that? Okay. Um, all right. Well, I guess I was, I was very lucky. I mean, to be influenced by uh, some critical teachers whose, whose method, if I could call it that, whose approach rather than method was to disrupt our, a custom way of thinking and to get us to think otherwise and not necessarily to force their views on us, but rather to give us the space to use critical concepts and skills to think for ourselves. Now, those teachers were very honest about where they stood, but they would no doubt have been happy if you would <laughs> subscribed to their views, but they really did give their students the space to think for themselves. One of them was a Marxist. I met him in my second year at university and he shocked us all by um, saying that uh, he was not going to stand there and pretend that the knowledge he was expounding from the lectern was neutral or uh, completely objective, that in fact it was uh, taking a partisan position a particular standpoint, and that, you know, that anyone that didn't do that was in fact engaging in a pretense or a contrivance that theirs was universal knowledge and applied to all people at all times. And particularly in the social sciences, he said, that's misleading. It's dishonest. You're actually masking where you stand. And, you know, by saying, oh, well, the current body of knowledge says this and scientists agree on, on that or the current weight, he said, you've got to be able to also at the same time say what you think and to own it. And you don't, uh, therefore, your student doesn't have to think your way, but you know where they stand and why. And uh, that impressed me. And then another teacher who impressed me was a, a Holocaust survivor 
who was, I suppose, a critical pedagogue, very much so. Uh, and he, he impressed a number of things on me. One of them is that the teacher, even though they have some authority, we all have authority. And that uh, education should, yes, bring us into a dialogue, a series of exchanges. And that, that can be quite hard because the teacher must always then put themselves on the line. You know, he said, look, you need to think that you're right, but know with absolute certainty that you could be wrong. And with that sort of ethic, that's how you enter the educational conversation. Yeah, to know that you too can learn, that you are also a learner, along with those whom you're given responsibility for taking the class. And uh, look, I try to emulate that, but I don't know that I don't always succeed, of course. I don't think anybody does 100% of the time, but I'd like to think that's what I'm trying and aspiring to do in the classroom, you know, whether it's the lecture or, or tutorial space, to activate a dialogue around what's important, not just for me, but for the students and in relation to society more generally. Although you do have to start somewhere because Well, we don't always, you can't do it in a vacuum. You can't always know what you don't know. So I do think there is a legitimate role for the teacher to initiate the conversation. And that may mean initiating the topic or the subject matter, because saying to people that they should just go and think for themselves, that's like saying, especially about things like democracy and justice and freedom, It's a bit, you know, just saying just to think for yourself about those things is a bit like saying, well, go and play on the highway and you'll learn how to drive. There's a few steps missing in there before you get the hang of it. And so the teacher has a responsibility there to set up enough frameworks. And yes, you mentioned theory, I think, earlier. You know, theory shouldn't be anything uh, obtuse or I know the language of it can be. Theory is part of human doing. It should be a moment of being lucid, you know, a moment of lucidity in our actions, a moment of lucid reflection on practice. And we might use some big sounding words or concepts to help us do that as a shorthand. Yeah. Anyway, I hope that answers your question as best I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it definitely did. Thank you for that. And I think... Um, One of the takeaway I got from what you just said is that it is really important for education to provide students the ability to challenge maybe uh, what's already there and what's dominant in the society. So um, maybe going back to Christine, because I think you mentioned about neoliberalism in your introduction. And I think my question is regarding neoliberalism, how, how do you think critical pedagogy plays its role to challenge the dominant ideas that's coming from neoliberalism? Okay, so, I mean, neoliberalism is its main goal, if you like, in supporting global capitalism is to shut down our ability to think and to shut down our ability to critique. And one of the things that critical pedagogy does, of course, is critique. It starts with a critical analysis of society and also moves into critical self-reflection. And so... One of the things that I think is really powerful about critical pedagogy with the combination of both critical analysis and critical reflection is that we hold external power accountable and we're always thinking about the structural factors that shape people's experiences of disadvantage and oppression, but without becoming overwhelmed by that in a way that's potentially um, disempowering, we're also engaged in our understanding that our realities are socially constructed and so we have a capacity to be able to potentially think outside dominant discourses or think outside those hegemonic ideas, which is so fundamental for social workers and social work students who are bombarded with hegemonic discourses all the time. I was aware of teaching a course on critical reflection recently where students Some students described that they were on a placement that had indoctrinated them in the induction about clients lie. Now, this was a a food service, like a food and basic provisions um, service. And so when that is your perspective, that clients lie and they're trying to get more out of the service than what they're entitled is, and your job is to find them out, you know, that 
in my mind, is not something that students need a degree in to do. I mean, you can go and do that kind of judgmental, punitive type, abusive practice without a degree, but that we're kind of horrified that practitioners who lead these organisations are saying that while we're trying to teach students to think critically is is a bit of a a difficulty and we no longer send students to that organisation now, of course. But I just think what critical pedagogy can do in relation to neoliberalism is help students think outside of it because it's such a powerful discourse in terms of blaming the victim and individual responsibility that it almost leads practitioners to become adopt a, a, almost a social control type stance where they feel like they have to be social police in terms of conscripted into this agenda of policing scarce, scarce resources. But resources aren't scarce. And, you know, we, we have enough wealth within this world to feed and, and, and house everybody, but we often can get into deserving and undeserving type idea and... I think, you know, in terms of critical pedagogy, Avashi Mala's work on, Magalit, sorry, his work on the decent society and how it charges a, a society with indecency when the structures that we have set up in our very own welfare systems, which are supposed to support people, serve to humiliate them and to judge them and to deem them as, as unworthy. And so I think what critical pedagogy can do is, I hope, give students and practitioners alternative ways to understand disadvantage, alternative ways to understand the ways that capitalism produces poverty, people don't produce poverty, and how then to think outside it, to to agitate for change, to make a difference, to be able to facilitate advocacy and access to resources rather than the students and practitioners feeling like they're caught into this this role of being neoliberal soldiers, as I mentioned. Yeah. Thanks for your answer. I think I felt like that's quite touching because I'm actually from a business background. So I have those neoliberalism idea for quite a long time, to be honest. But uh, Most yeah. People Most people mm. do. And, and it is the dominant discourse. So what critical pedagogy is doing is trying to shine light on alternative discourses and actually look at the structural determinants of inequality so that we can become part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Yeah. Well said. Thanks for that. Kind of want to move a little bit towards the practical ends. So I'm thinking if you can share maybe a story of yourself that leads you to this uh, being a critical practitioner or maybe some of the challenges that you have faced along the way. In terms of challenges in relation to teaching critical pedagogy, I think it isn't, it's not the dominant, it's not the mainstream. So it's like for critical practitioners who are sort of, you know, trying to do an ethical kind of practice in neoliberal organisations, it can often feel like you're swimming against the the tide a little Mm. bit Um, and that can be challenging in terms of support for advancing a critical agenda. It's really important to have allies. It's really important to connect with people who you know share a critical agenda and to know that you're part of a movement like we're not just lone crusaders out there doing this work to try and challenge systems and, and discourses but we're part of a large movement of scholars of practitioners of political activists who are trying to make a difference and who I think are making a difference and will make a difference and I think that work will become even more important you know as we move into the age of the pandemic and the age of climate change and as we've had widening inequalities which don't look like being arrested at this point in time many times soon so I think the work that we do as critical practitioners whether that's in social work practice directly or whether that's in education whether it's in other disciplines and other professions I think that work is really important yeah that's what I would say supports me I don't know if that answered your question but (laughs) it does it does absolutely yeah even by talking about it, I can feel the you know the pressure to advocate critical pedagogy in the workplace because it's it's not mainstream, and that means you you always face oppositions, and it's from majority of people out there. I think now it's to you, Flip. Do you have any oh. story you want to share? There are just so many 
I suppose, instances, not, I, I can't think of one event where I thought, all right, now I'm a critical pedagogue. Mm-hmm. It, as I said, it was a number of significant account, encounters with particular teachers, some of them quite confronting, or through my involvement in social movements, in student life. Uh, I was a member of the student movement um, in the Australian Union of Students. Uh, as I said to you, I, I had my eyes open to the fact that we were living in a capitalist society and that it was a society that tended towards inequality. So it wasn't just my individual efforts at working hard to get good marks or working hard at my job to get ahead that positions us in society. It's actually a system that tends towards inequality and it needs most people to be earning a fairly low income. There's a downward pressure on wages is how the system works. Not everyone can earn um, a high paying wage. It's not designed to do that. And so, but then we get these systems that blame people because they can't make ends meet. And I thought, oh, there's perversity going. And so that opened my eyes, I suppose, to the impact of social structures on our agency. It's not that we have no agency, of of course we do, but, but as individuals, we have far less agency than say if we acted collectively. Um, you know, the role of trade unions, of reform movements, of political parties, of, of social movements. And so it got me thinking about those questions and, you know, what role am I playing? Not necessarily consciously within these structures. The Marxist lecturer that I told you about, he was very provocative. He said, uh, you know, Marx had the view that all human beings are creators. That is, we all work, we all labor, we all produce things. That's part of human nature is to make things. He said, but you here as students, what is your role in the economy? You're parasites. He said, <laughs> and I was, I was shocked. He was being quite deliberately provocative and, and using humor, but to get us to think, well, what is my role in the political economy of, of society? What, what other ways could we do that that don't separate uh, mental and manual labor, being and thinking, or doing and thinking that don't divide those things, management from managed. Are there ways of reconciling those and uh, not positioning ourselves in subordinate roles and allowing that sort of divisiveness uh, to occur? The same thing, I suppose, an awakening in regard to feminism, I'd already learned about capitalism and I was a convinced socialist and so on. But at the Australian Union of Students meeting, I was still using a very gendered language. I was talking about the males as men and I was using the term girl quite unconsciously in referring to women. And then the women's officer of the Australian Union of Students confronted me and said, what do you mean calling us girls? We're women. You know, and I thought, oh, (laughs) And, uh, and I hadn't realised I'd been doing it, you see. <laughs> it, it was quite... An, and then I, um, I felt I couldn't use gendered terms at all for about a month. I was in rigor verbis, so I just... But it made me think and it made me change. And she was right. You know, I, I was reproducing a gendered discourse that positioned women unequally to men. And so it might seem a little thing, but it, it was actually pointing at quite a significant power division in our societies. So it's little things, well, it's a series of events like that rather than one conversion experience. Yeah. And then I I learned a lot in the Philippines too, when I went there as a, a visiting student activist and they were in the midst of revolutionary uprising against the Marcos dictatorship. So that had a huge shattering effect on my worldview and the world that I'd been accustomed to in suburban Australia, even though working class, I I hadn't seen the sort of poverty and repression that I saw in the Philippines at that time, all of which gets you to question constantly the society you live in, and it should get you to bring yourself into question as well, what you're doing in that. Beautiful. I think you've given us a very vivid example of how to use critical pedagogy that is to always challenge those thoughts that we might 
not be aware of that maybe there are the results from the society, the, the majority of the, of the voice. I think it's time for us to wrap up. But before we're doing that, is there anything else you want to add to, to the conversation? Or maybe any words to the practitioners out there who want to be a critical practitioner? I think I would just say don't give up on thinking critically, even though your organisations might not always do critical practice. Often their mandates will say that they do. And so we use those to try and find the spaces, to try and find the allies within the organisation as there will be, to connect with service users, to connect with outside social movements, and let's work together to try and create change. Yeah, Yeah. agreed. Do you want to say the same, same as Christine from you? Oh, I, I <laughs> wanted her to have the last word <laughs> to affirm. She's the uh, social work professor. So. <laughs> okay. Well, then I'd like to thank you both for taking part in this podcast. I feel I've really learned a lot through it. Uh, I hope the same for the audience too. And I guess that all concludes this episode. Stay safe and stay tuned for more thought-provoking stories like this to come on Critical Conversations for Social Work. Bye. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you. If you'd like to keep up with any of our socials and to continue listening to future episodes, please follow us on Instagram. That's Critical Conversations, the number four SW.